Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. I was born in Texas. I'm a University of Texas graduate. If you cut me, I bleed burnt orange. But God has such a sense of humor. For the past, well, it'll be 30 years this May, I've lived in Oklahoma. I look at OSU and OU people every Sunday. God has to have a humor, I'll guarantee you. But man, it's good to be back, and it's awesome to be here. I am absolutely an emotional, ridiculously. People at my church just know I cry at the drop of a hat. So I'm not going to say much. I'm just going to tell you, I am blessed beyond words to have this young man in my life. And I, I, I know that it's worth the $5 he paid me to say young, okay? <laughs> but when you're my age... Trust me, he is young. I uh, retired about uh, 13 months ago, and I'm in a biker uh, ministry, the priesthood. We have chapters here in Texas. And uh, so I started letting my persona as a, you know, a biker start to grow. And you know, I was thinking, man, I'm going to stand in his pulpit. I'm a little concerned about that. But then I thought, <laughs> no. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Father, what a privilege for me to stand here in my brother's pulpit. And I know this is precious to him. So I'm honored to stand here, Father. But more than that, I'm honored to always break bread, your bread, with your people. So, Father, just anoint me for the task that is ahead of me. Use me as your conduit so that your love flows through me. And let your message and it alone be what they hear and what they receive. And move me out of the way. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I can see some heads. You recognize that song. That's one of the most meaningful songs and probably one of the first songs that all of us learned on our journey towards becoming a child of God. It's a simple song, but it taught us this incredibly wonderful spiritual truth. Jesus loves me. How incredible is that? One little tiny speck on the spectrum of humanity, and yet He knows me, created me, and he loves me. Wow. Now along with that truth, that underlying truth, we also learned that we are to look to the Bible to find our truth. Because I know Jesus loves me based on what the Bible tells me. Amen? So, I think there's no greater principle, no greater truth that you can learn as a child or really at any age than the wonderful fact that Jesus loves. He loves. And He loves everyone. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. 
Jesus loves the little children of the world. There's nobody he doesn't love. No one that he doesn't love. In fact, if we were hard-pressed to describe our wonderful Savior and Lord, that would be impossible. But if we were hard-pressed, I think it would be that we would say, He is love. Almost everything else branches off of that. He is literally the epitome of love. Everything, and I mean everything Jesus has done and is still doing is an act of pure, unselfish love. In fact, I will just tell you as we start this series, every image of Jesus that you will hear about in this series, Snapshots of Jesus, has the underlying foundation of His incredible love. Since the moment when God decided to create a being with a body, soul, and spirit who would have the capability to love and worship Him, from that very moment, God, even before, let's say that, even before, God knew mankind would fail. And mankind would choose sin and rebellion. And before there was a mankind, God the Son was already willing to do what was necessary to provide a means whereby mankind could be restored back into fellowship with their Creator. So even before man existed, God the Son loved them, loved us, enough to fulfill His heavenly Father's plan of redemption. Now, we, we know this is true because if you've read Scripture... In Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 29, and I happen to be reading from the New American Standard, this is what it says. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, that's in Jesus, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, holy and blameless beyond reproach. This was the Father's plan that Jesus fulfilled because of his love For mankind. Now stop for just a minute and think to yourself, this is a big thought, probably beyond all of us, but we're just saying we're going to think. Think about all the masses of humanity that has come and gone since Adam and Eve. Now if you don't know, that's billions of people. Now, think of the untold barbaric, sadistic, cruel, mean people that have lived all down through history and even live today and then wrap your mind around the fact and truth that Jesus loves even them. When you do so, you realize That Jesus is a lover. I'm talking about the worst of the worst all through the course of history. But when you realize Jesus loves them, this should give you some sense of the magnitude of the love Jesus had for humanity. Because Jesus is love. Say that with me. Jesus is love. I'll say amen to you. Now, there is an aspect of love we see in Jesus that is not often focused on. But I want to mention it this morning because you can't really talk about Jesus the lover and not mention this. And I'm referring to how much Jesus loved and loves his heavenly Father. Only the deepest, most incredible love could motivate to the level of obedience Jesus had towards his heavenly father. I mean, there is no other motivation. Why would you do what he did? Only love. 
We just saw in Colossians that it was the Father's plan for Jesus to suffer and die on the cross to pay for the sin of mankind. But the Father did not force Jesus to comply. He didn't send him to earth with no ability to say no, with no ability to escape. Jesus complied. Jesus chose to love his heavenly Father enough to be obedient to his plan of redemption for mankind. We know this was a choice. Maybe you're thinking, well, how do you know that was a choice? Well, we know it was a choice because of the beautiful and powerful passage of Scripture that tells us of the humanity of Christ and the obedience he had to overcome his humanity. Now, the text of uh, of what I'm saying or what I'm fixing to share with you is Jesus is struggling as he's facing his own upcoming death. He even mentions the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. We see the humanity of Jesus here. And here in our passage that I'm fixing to share, we get to see the reality of Jesus being made in the likeness of men as he struggles with what awaits him. And yet his great love for his Father absolutely compels him to obediently fulfill the Father's plan. In the Gospel of Luke, it records this, this moving passage. It's just short, Luke twenty two forty two. 42. But listen to the words of Jesus. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. I don't know how many men here have children. How many women have children? We're talking about father, but it's the same emotion. If your child came to you and was facing something that was so horrendous and said, could we do something else? Can you imagine how that would pull at your heart? And how much that must have pulled at the father's heart. But Jesus quickly says, yet not my will, but yours be done. This, this is pure love that we see here. For nothing less could motivate him to this level of obedience. So not only does Jesus love all of humanity, but oh, how he loves his Father. Now I'm sure if you have sat under preaching for very long, You've probably heard messages on the different Greek words that are translated as love in English but have different and distinct meanings in the Greek. The word that describes the love Jesus has for the Father and the love that he has for all humanity is the Greek word agape. Agape. This type of love comes as an exercise of the will. In other words, you choose, you will to love with agape love. It is love that is a deliberate choice, not merely an impulse based on feelings. See, Jesus deliberately chooses to love all humanity. And this is how he loves even the worst of the worst. He chooses to love them. They're the most unlovable of humanity. We would want to see them gone. We would do what was necessary to eliminate them. Jesus looks at them with love. Yes, amen. Nothing shows us agape love like the actions of Jesus to step into flesh and blood and become a human in order to fulfill God the Father's plan to redeem mankind from sin. I mean, he is sharing the Godhead in heaven. And he takes on flesh. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 is an incredible passage that reminds us of this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he was in heaven, part of the Godhead, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. 
Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Listen, if the actions of love do not match the words of love, then it's really not love at all. Now that's an amen there, folks. Let me say that again. If the actions of love do not match the words of love, then it's not really love at all. Trust me, I've done enough counseling to know that the, I tell her I love her all the time. Yeah, but you don't act like you love her. And she needs actions, not words. Or, you know, she tells me she loves me all the time, but I can't get her to do anything. You, know, you, you, you hear that all the time. Because love is action. So when I say Jesus is love, this is not simply nice words to describe his emotion towards us. His love is fleshed out in actions that undeniably tells us how much he loves us. After all, Jesus willingly surrendered his glorious position and status in heaven to become a helpless infant. Now, it'd be one thing to leave heaven and and arrive as a king or to arrive as as this beautiful, handsome person that everybody admires and looks at. He started off just like every one of us, a helpless infant. An infant taking on all the aspects of being human. He had to eat. He had to sleep. He had to go to the bathroom. He felt pain. And he felt every other emotion we feel as humans. Now why on earth would the king of kings, God the son, why would he do such a thing? The answer is he loves. He loves. That is the reason. Love for his father and love for mankind. He is in fact... You can put this down. He is, in fact, the greatest lover in all of history and eternity. There will never be one like him. There's never been one like him. Now, I believe it's incredibly important for us to understand just how powerful his love really is. You see, Jesus' love is unconditional. Now, I've heard that my whole life. And you've probably heard that, too. But it's just a statement that is made, and, and most of that never sinks into the core of who we are. And I know that's true because of our actions when certain things happen. But see, Jesus loves with unconditional love. Now, you have probably heard it, but do you realize what that really means? Simply put, and this is as simple as I can say it, this means He does not love you more when you're good. And love you less when you're bad. Jesus just loves you. The good, the bad, the ugly, the wonderful, all of it. He just loves you. And he doesn't get more excited about that when you're good and less excited when you're bad. He, his love is unconditional. It's unchanging. Jesus just loves us, period. You know, through my almost 37 years as a senior pastor, I have had many discussions and debates on the theology of eternal security. And before I make the point that I'm fixing to make, I I do want to say, I I acknowledge the Bible speaks of an unforgivable sin, and that sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which means to reject, refuse, or to deny the Holy Spirit works the Holy Spirit's work in calling you to Christ, to salvation. So in reality, rejection of Christ is the unforgivable sin because He's the only way to have our sin removed. Having said this, I have personally come to this conclusion. You may think I'm all wet. But I'll put my 37 year, 37 plus years as a senior pastor up against your opinions, although they're your opinions and you can have them. But I'm telling you, after all that time, I have come to the 
personal con conclusion that those who believe you can lose your salvation believe this not so much as a theological truth, although they'll argue some scriptures with you. I think when you take the time to look at those scriptures in the context of, of the Bible, their arguments fall away, but they'll, they'll use those not so much theological truth, but in reality because they cannot wrap their mind around our Lord's unconditional love, they say, well, you've got to be able to lose your salvation. I mean, if you do that, or if you think this, or you act that way, or if you're this kind of person, I mean, come on now, that's enough. That's the end. You can't do that. See, they're, they're taking Jesus' unconditional love and kind of throwing that out. Because they cannot justify love towards certain behaviors or certain sins. They cannot imagine Jesus continuing to hold on to or accept such a person's salvation. He just wouldn't do that, would he? Oh yeah, he would. Because he's love. So let me just stop there and say, when you screw up, and you screw up really bad, and maybe nobody even knows it but you and God, but you know it. And then unfortunately sometimes, Edward just talked about himself, sometimes the world finds out about it. It does not affect how Jesus loves you. It does not affect how Jesus loves you. It does not affect how Jesus loves you. Why? Because his love is unconditional. Woo! That's good stuff. Such a belief that you can lose it is, is completely unbiblical and denies Jesus' unconditional love. Now, why would I say that? Well, just listen to what God's Word says. That's why I say it's unbiblical. Romans 8, verse 35, and then I'm going to read 37 through 39. Just listen to the words. I don't even have to help this. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Good question. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is where you say, Amen. 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 Woo! This covers every possible scenario. In fact, Paul is an incredibly intelligent guy, one of the most educated men who wrote Scripture. And I think he set out to try to cover every possible thought that you could say, yeah, but what if? Yeah, but you could, you know, but Paul, it, nope, he's covering all the bases. He's wanting to make the point that Jesus loves with unconditional love that overcomes everything. Everything else. Jesus is truly love. He drips love. He is love. And how incredibly privileged we are to be recipients of this love. There's not a one of us here who deserve his love. No one deserves his love. And yet he pours that love out. Now, folks, with great privilege comes great responsibility. Having such a love as this cannot and should not be held on to or hoarded. Remember, love is action. And we, by virtue of receiving this amazing love, are in turn to be conduits through which this love flows. In fact, you cannot read God's Word and not realize that this unbelievable love that Jesus gives to us, we are in turn to give to others. You can't miss that if you read Scripture. Jesus even went so far as to say, the way the world will know that we belong to Him 
is by our love for one another. Here's what the Bible says in John 13 in verses 34 and 35. Jesus is speaking himself. A new commandment I give you. We've had commandments before. Jesus is saying, okay, listen carefully. I'm giving you a new one. It's not just the big 10. We got some, this is new. It's fresh and it's coming from me. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we, my friends, are being called to have agape love for our fellow man. In other words, as we are loved by Jesus, we in turn are to love others and love them with the same type of love we receive from Jesus, which is Agape love. And remember, agape love is intentional love. Well, I just love everybody, do you? I hear people say that. Did you see that guy turn in front of me? You You know? Did you see what that guy did? And we were just off. Now, that's human, and I know. Trust me, when I get up in front of Celebrate Recovery, I'm, I'm... serve and celebrate recovery, one of the things that I say is impatience behind the will. So my wife said, boy, he chose that example well because I can get really frustrated the way some people drive. Wish they all drove good like I do. <laughs> but the, the reality is we say that. We love everyone. But is that agape love? I don't think so. Because agape love is intentional love. It's love of deliberate choice as an exercise of the will. Love you, brother. (laughs) You know, that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. This means our love is not to be about whether we like someone. And if we don't like them, well, they don't get the love. That's, That's not agape love. That's not the love Jesus told us to have that shows that we belong to him. So we're simply to give them that which we receive from Jesus, agape love. Not because we like them or we, uh, we think they're deserving of our love. No, everyone, everyone. Now, I'm going to be really honest, and, and I've told my kids this. Man, I love for you, I, 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 to the best of my sincere meaning, I would die for you. But you just need to know I don't have unconditional love because I'm human. I want to, but I don't. I got buttons. I got triggers just like you do. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't. And my goal is to be like Christ. Amen? amen. So I need to avoid those triggers. I need to avoid those buttons. And I need to decide by my will through the empowerment of his spirit to live accordingly. Now, why would Jesus want us to be a conduit of his love? Because love is without any doubt truly the most powerful force imaginable. Love moves mountains. Love opens doors. It changes paradigms. It builds bridges. It fills gaps. It forgives. It forgets. It restores. And it changes lives. Every believer who has experienced the love of Jesus is called to be a force of love in this love-starved world that we live in. We're to emulate our loving Savior Jesus Christ because Jesus loves all humanity. But what a great calling He's given to us. What a great calling to love. I mean, We've received it. Now we just need to open ourselves and be a conduit that it flows through. That's what we're called for. What a great message to give to those who know nothing about His love. And the world is filled with people who have never experienced anything close to an unconditional love. 
If you're here this morning and you have never really experienced the love of Jesus, then it's time you did. Everything I've been talking about, the love of Christ, is a love he has for you. And the epitome of that love is the grace that he offers you to erase, to pay the price for your sin. And trust me, the Bible's clear, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. That's the love that he offers to you this morning. Remember, it's not about being good enough or having your act together. Because the enemy whispers that into our, into our ears. Well, you, you, just, you know, you need to wait. You've got so much stuff you need to get in line. Then you can come to God. Then you've got something to offer. He doesn't want anything you can do. And the truth is, there is no way for you to be good enough. There's no way for you to get your act together. You don't have the power. You can impress people, but God knows every thought and every intent of your heart. So you need to come to him and receive his love and enjoy his grace and accept the gift of everlasting life that he gives to you. You see, accepting his love is simply accepting the truth that he loves you and wants to be your savior and your Lord. And through his love, you can know forgiveness of your sins and you can have, receive eternal life. All you have to do is surrender yourself to his love. That's what he wants. He just wants you. Yeah, but th this, this, no, no, no. He just wants you. Right. Just like you are. Just come to him and give yourself to him. If you've never done this, then you need to do that today. Amen. And I'll pray with you in just a moment, but I want to... I honestly think the majority of us here this morning are probably already aware of his love. I've probably not told you anything absolutely new because this truth was inside you because you've already accepted Christ's love. And the truth is just being reminded to your spirit. And you've experienced Jesus loving you firsthand. So my question for us who have experienced this is does the world see his love in us? Our country and our world, oh my gosh, we are so divided with so much hostility towards those who are different from us or who have different opinion than, than we do or have a different faith than we do. And I honestly, with all my heart and sincerity, I believe the only real remedy for such division is the love of Jesus. Listen, we can love and demonstrate love without agreeing with someone. I don't have to accept the things that they say or the actions that they commit. But I can still love them because it's agape love, a love of choice. So we can love and demonstrate without those things. I really think it's time that we got serious about being the force of love in our world. That Jesus, through his love for us has called us to. Maybe you need to make a fresh commitment to being this force of love today. Let's follow the lead of Jesus. He was the lover. Pray with me, would you? Father God, there's, there's not enough words to say thank you for our Savior Jesus and the love that He has demonstrated towards us. Right now I ask in, in your name, Lord Jesus, that those who are here who may never have really grasped how much you love them, that your Spirit is right now guiding them in that and helping them that, to see that. And as they come to grips with the fact that you love them with this unconditional love and you accept them just as they are, any changes in them will be made through your power. You don't require that before they come to you. That they will say yes to you this day, Father. And invite you into their life as their Savior and their Lord. So, Father, 
touch them and woo them and draw them to you today that they might say yes to you. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who have experienced your love. We've gotten complacent, many of us, Lord, and we just go through life and we love the people that we love, but we're really not conduits of the love that's unconditional. We may not have that physical, emotional capability, but we have your power in us that can overcome our problems, overcome our defenses, and allow us to love everyone. God, let us let people see that you love them by seeing how we love them. So bless us to be what you want us to be today as your loving conduits, letting your love flow through us into our world. Father, I pray this in your powerful, powerful name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.